This morning, I wanted to, uh, to start with something. Have you guys heard about kind of like this, um, this new trend? It's really, really popular right now. Um, everyone's talking about it in the, in the health world. It's called fasting. Have you heard of it? Everyone's talking about fasting, fasting. Fa in fact, uh, a really popular one right now is everyone's talking about intermittent fasting. Intermi you should be intermittent fasting. Oh, it's, man, it's, it's like a miracle, this thing called intermittent fasting. It turns out if you don't eat 18 hours a day, you lose weight. It's like a miracle, and you're like... Yeah, that seems like that would be the case. If you didn't eat 18 hours a day, I'm guessing you would lose weight. That seems like that would, that would work, right? Um, but no, there's this, all this conversation around fasting, um, and it, it actually isn't a joke, uh, believe it or not. There are scientific benefits of fasting. Uh, fasting can be linked to improved lifespan, according to Harvard Research. Fasting can be linked to improved brain function, according to Scientific American. Fasting can be linked to improved seizure control, according to PubMed. And fasting can be actually linked to improved long-term brain health uh, by elements of health. Now, as much as that is cool, here's what's really cool. Jesus and our Bible have been telling us that fasting is even more powerful than that for thousands of years. It's intriguing that fasting is like this kind of, right now it's a very trendy conversation, intermittent fasting, all these things. But for thousands of years, people have participated in fasting and, and the word of God has said that it has this significant impact in our life for thousands of years. And that's actually, I'm going to come back and talk about that in a second. Before I go forward, just quick recap so we can go forward. I know last week was like literally the, the coldest day ever, and some of you guys weren't here. Um, but when we started this year, we talked about where we were going in 2024, and specifically we felt like God was pointing us towards this verse, Proverbs 4.25, look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. We felt like God was saying that for 2024, the goal would be focus. Focus. And it's literally found inside that verse. You can see the two pieces of it looking straight ahead. That's the idea of narrowing down. And then the idea of fixing your eyes on what lies before you, fixing your vision, meaning making it sharp, making it crisp, making it clear. And we said it this way, in 2024, we want focus, which means less distractions and more clarity in this year. Can anybody say amen if you want that in 2024, right? Less distractions, more clarity. Now, it said this, in that same proverb, I told you there's a benefit associated with this, because many of you are like, yeah, we need to slow down, we need to do this, we need to just step back. And I said, it's actually funny because the proverb doesn't say that's what focus does. It actually says in Proverbs 4, 11 through 12, I will teach you wisdom, way, wisdom ways, excuse me, and lead you on a straight path. That's that focus path. And when you walk, you won't be held back. When you run, you won't stumble. It's actually an indicator that when we have focus, we move forward faster than ever, that we're no longer being held back by the protective hand of God, that we're no longer tripping ourselves up in our own sinfulness, and that the focused life is actually the one where we can gain momentum, we can gain progress in our life. I want you to have the most focused year of your life. I want you to get farther and faster than ever before, and I want our church to have a focused year. I want us to be able to continue to move forward as a church towards what God's calling is for us, to be able to increase in influence in this community. Now, in order to have have for focus, I told you the two things you got to work on this year, less distractions, more clarity. If you keep going, how can I become more focused? How, really simple, less distractions, more clarity. Those are your two barrels of the shotgun to get it done, okay? Last week, I started to talk to you about more clarity. And just for reference, less distractions, more clarity is kind of going to be like the theme of probably the whole rest of our year, because I could talk to you about that for 100 weeks easily in regards to your faith. But last week, starting the conversation of more clarity, I told you this, the best way to get more clarity in your life is to get more of God's word in your life. That's the secret. If you're wondering where you can start in regards to wanting more clarity, the secret is more of God's word. And I told you to make it really easy for us, just if you weren't here, catch you up. If you're just joining us online, we are actually starting a unified, altogether, focus Bible study where our entire church, we're inviting you to read the same Bible plan. We actually created a Bible plan that will take us all the way through the end of the year. 
every single day. It's a couple of chapters, takes you about 10 or 15 minutes where you can read, you can grow. And if you're wondering, what can I do? It's really simple. You can jump in with us and then you have an entire community to discuss what you're reading and learning about. If you weren't here last week, go back and check it out. Or as you leave today at our guest services, the printout of our plan is there. You can also go on our social media to get that. It is not too late. Quick recap for you guys. Some of you totally failed this last week, okay? You're like, yeah, totally failed, okay? Really, qu really quick, okay? Do not try to get caught up. Just start on the day you're on, okay? All the time, I'll be like, well, I'm like a few days behind, Cameron. I got to get caught up. You'll never get caught up. You're fine. Just read today's and move forward, okay? That's the answer if you missed one of those situations. Now, today at the beginning of the year, as I talked about more clarity, now I want to talk about less distractions just to get us started. And there are a multitude of different things that you can do in order to decrease the distractions. But at the beginning of the year, I want to point your eyes on a practice often overlooked by the American church, even though science is now catching up to understand what Christians have been experiencing for thousands of years. And here is what it is. Fasting is actually a great way to test out less distractions. Now, fasting by definition is abstaining from food, okay? In the Jewish culture where Jesus was at, it was extremely prevalent. Fasting was very, very common. Many people fasted multiple times a week where they would not eat from sundown, uh, from, excuse me, from sunup to sundown, or actually it would be sundown to sundown very often is what they would do. And in fact, this was one of the sticking points for Jesus. Believe it or not, in Matthew 9, 14 through 15, they complained about Jesus because he didn't fast enough. They said one day the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus and asked him, why don't your disciples fast like we do? And the Pharisees do. And Jesus replied, do wedding guests mourn while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. Someday the groom will be taken away and then they will fast. Jesus' life actually wasn't marked by a lot of fasting. His disciples weren't marked by a lot of fasting while he was here. But he did say this, when I leave, they will fast. Get that. Jesus said that his church will fast. They'll participate in this dynamic. Now, my take is this. When I look at Jesus' life, when I look at the disciples' life, when I look at the New Testament, I believe that fasting is not actually meant to be a common practice of the Christian. Like the Jew, they would fast multiple times a week, and it was this consistent thing. I actually don't think that's the marker of Christianity. That's this common practice. We don't actually see it just in commonplace in the first church. But you know what we do see is we see it as a consistent practice at specific times in people's lives. It's not like an every week thing. It's not like an all the time thing. Like every single week I do this day or I do this. We don't see that in the Bible. But what we do see is over and over and over again, it consistently happens in faithful believers' lives in specific times. Now, I'll show this to you. Jesus, he did fast right before he started his public ministry. In Matthew 4, 1 through 2, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. This is immediately after his baptism, before he goes back and starts his public ministry, right before an important journey of faith, right before he moves into something in his faith. We see this a little while later in Acts 13, 2 through 3, where the church leaders are fasting before God sets out missionaries from them. It says this, One day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I've called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. Right before these men were called to the ministry, they were in this time of prayer and fasting, I think maybe looking forward to like, where is the church going what are we doing next? And in fact, we see this kind of commonplace then in Paul and Barnabas in Acts 14, 23, just the next chapter. It says Paul and Barnabas also appointed elders in every church. So when they would leave a church they would plant, with prayer and fasting, they turned the elders over to the care of the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Before they made the big decision of who to leave in charge of the churches they had planted, they would fast and they would pray. Now, 
Here's what I need you to get, because you see this picture. So before these, these moments happen, before this kind of journey in these areas happen, these, these Christians were fasting. I need you to get this. This is not people earning the favor or the blessing of God by punishing themselves by taking away food. Because that's actually like some other faiths around the world believe that, that like as you punish yourself, uh, you, you were in the favor of God. Like these men, they, they, they didn't eat and then the Lord moved because they didn't eat, right? Like they, they, they punished their body and then the Lord decided to, to bless them in some way or another. And I need you to get to this. It's, it's, it's not like they demonstrated to God how righteous they were. Like, look at us, God. We haven't eaten days, right? And then God's like, you're right, right? And sends them like this bolt of lightning, it wasn't that they were trying to warrant God's move in their life in some way or another. In fact, Jesus one time when he was teaching, he tells the story about two men who prayed and it's such a clear picture of the fact that that's not how our faith works. We don't earn God's move in our life. We don't earn God's blessing in our life. In Luke 18, 9 through 14, he tells this story. Check this out. Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. So he makes up the story. He goes, hey, real quick, two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and those are the people who are really, really religious, right? And the other one was a despised tax collector, lowest of the low in the community, right? He says, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed like this, I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. You can kind of maybe even see him. Maybe he's like looking around as he's saying it, right? Cheaters adulterers, sinners. He says this, I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. Wow, right? Wow. But the tax collector stood at a distance, dared not even lift his eyes to heaven and he prayed as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I'm a sinner. Jesus says this, I tell you, the sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. It's a cool story because he said this guy comes, and basically, like, that guy thinks that mindset about God that like he's going to come and be like I, I fast twice a week God and that God's going to be like oh my goodness you skipped a meal you, you skipped two meals three meals two days in a week <sighs> Holy Spirit just pour out on that man look at him right I give a tenth of my income and God's just going to be like bold oh my gosh right and he says, there's people who think of that, that like you're going to come and you're going to impress God by your, by your sacrifice. And he says, then there's this other guy who just come and he just goes, I'm a mess, God. I don't have anything figured out in my life. I'm a sinner. I just need your grace. And he goes, that man was justified, made right in God's eyes, was made into right relationship with God. The one who thought he could earn it by his performance, that he could do something in order to gain the favor of God, he did not leave in right relationship with God. Think about it this way, okay? When we talk about the concept of fasting, people were thinking like, you're going to fast and then God's going to have to move or you're going to fast and then God's going to do something because he understands how serious you are. I need you to get this, okay? Fasting is not to demonstrate your seriousness to God. It's to demonstrate your seriousness to yourself. Think about that for a second. It's not like you fast to display to God how serious you are about wanting him to move. God, I haven't ate for two days. Do you see how serious I am? Fasting is to demonstrate to yourself how serious you are about what you're praying. Not to impress God, but to go, I care about this so much. I would forgo the things I need to be able to keep my attention on the one thing I need God to do. Not to impress God. 
It's to show to ourselves what we actually care about. You see, fasting, the idea of cutting out food for a moment, right, cutting that out of our life, is about less distractions. And less distractions mean more time for prayer. And listen, prayer is where you really find your focus. The rest of the year, we're talking about focus, focus, focus. Let me tell you, the center of focus in the Christian life is prayer. It's communication with God. It's talking to him. And fasting is this opportunity to be able to let go of something that's good in order to put our attention on something that's even better. In fact, that's what Pastor John Piper said in a message. He says this, fasting is a temporary renunciation of something good in order to intensify our desire for something greater. Do you see that? It's a renunciation, not of something sinful. Listen, you can't fast from something sinful. Like, you can't fast. Like, I'm going to fast, you know, getting blackout drunk. And you're like, no, that's just called, like, sanctification. You don't fast that. Like, that's not what it is. You're fasting something that's good. And listen, it's not just the idea of the removal of food, because that's not it. It has to be about the spiritual aspect where you're, you're renouncing something that's good in order to think of my desire is for something greater than what that food would bring to me in this moment. Again, not trying to impress God, not to demonstrate your seriousness to him, but to demonstrate your seriousness to yourself, putting your body in alignment with what's in your spirit, or spirit and body. So it's putting our body kind of in obedience to, in alignment with what's in our heart and in our spirit. In Matthew 4, 3 through 4, Jesus, when he was in this fast, had this conversation with the devil. It says this, during that time, the devil came and said to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. And Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, when we fast, we have the opportunity to focus on prayer. And it's fascinating because the devil comes and he says, Jesus, aren't you hungry? Well, I mean, it's easy. You're, you're the son of God. Just tell these, these stones to become bread. And what Jesus shows him is this, more than I need bread, I need God's word in my life. He goes, are you hungry? Solve that. And he goes, oh, I know I could solve that whenever I want to. As much as my body desires food right now, my spirit desires the voice of God even more. Oh, I know I could eat. I'm choosing not to, to place my body in alignment with my spirit, that when I feel that, that pain inside of my stomach, and this is what I've experienced in fasting and why I've noticed that it's, it's powerful, when our body is clamoring, going, you need to eat, we have this amazing opportunity then for our spirit and our mind to respond and say, as much as my body needs food, my soul needs God. Even more than the desire inside of me to, to end this hunger is the desire to hear the Lord. I'm not doing this to prove to him how serious I am. I'm doing this to show myself, to teach myself how much this means to me. Now, I need you to get this. It's not just skipping food. If you just skip food, that's just called dieting. There's no dieting in the Bible. Praise the Lord. If you guys are like, I'm going to skip, I'm going to fast once a week, and, and what you are is just not eating, that's just a diet, that's fine. If everybody at X Church lost 10 pounds, we'd probably be a lot better off. I'll be honest with you. I got a little bit extra. I can get rid of two, okay? But that's not the point of fasting. The point of fasting isn't really actually the physical attributes, which is fascinating because they're there, which is just so cool to think. For 2,000 years, Christians have done this practice. And now, 2,000 years later, the science is finally catching up saying, there's actually a bunch of health benefits for this, which is hilarious. But that's not the why behind this. You see, the point of fasting is that in a spiritual sense, we want to fast to remove something in order to increase prayer. I don't think that in God's humor, okay, I actually think it's funny, 
I think it's funny that it's called fasting because all it does is slow down your day. It's really comedic, isn't it? A fast, and you're like, the fat is the slowest day I've had, right? When I was fasting, it was the slowest I've had of a day. It, it creates this less distractions and more time for prayer. For many of us, you spend a lot of your day thinking about what you're going to eat. A lot. Have any of you ever had the experience like I have? You literally eat like your breakfast and you get to like work and you're like, what am I going to eat for lunch? It's like 9.01 and you're like, what is lunch going to be? And you eat lunch and you're immediately like, I wonder what dinner is going to be. Have you guys ever had where you ate Chinese food and then someone else wants to get Chinese food and you're like, I just ate Chinese food, but actually Chinese food does kind of sound good again. Yeah, I could eat Chinese for lunch and for dinner. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, absolutely. It takes up so much of our mental space. We spend so much time thinking about it and by saying, oh, actually, tomorrow I'm not eating at all. Sun up to sundown or sundown to sundown or whatever you do or breakfast or lunch. I'm not even going to bother with that. You can immediately shift that focus and think, what do I really want spiritually instead? You see, we need to increase in prayer when we decrease in regards to our food. In prayer, again, it's just talking to God. Don't make this more complex than it needs to be. People want to take these words and they make them like these super spiritual things. But Jesus did such a good job. In fact, in Luke 11, 1 through 4, it says that Jesus was so good at praying, people literally surrounded him and asked him one time. It says, Jesus was in a certain place praying, and as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray just as you taught, just as John, excuse me, taught his disciples. And Jesus said, this is how you should pray. And there could be all these different things that he does. He could write a whole sermon, and he doesn't do that. He just gives a simple diagram for it. He says like this, Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and don't let us yield to temptation. It's amazing. He says, here's what you can do. The first thing is it just focuses all on God's glory. Did you see that? He says, may your name be kept holy. You are a good God. You deserve all the goodness you have, right? And then the next part is this, just submitting the areas of your life that you need his help. It talks about the idea of sustenance. It talks about the idea of wrestling with forgiveness. It talks, uh, talks about the idea of becoming more like Jesus. It talks about asking for protection and strength. There's not some sort of big holy language. In fact, I laugh sometimes because a bunch of you, when I read that, it itched in your brain because you were taught the King James Version, weren't you? And you're like, that's not how it goes. <laughs> Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy and you're like, yeah, that's what you were taught. But what's hilarious is Jesus never wanted us to just repeat that prayer over and over and over again. He was giving us a simple path to follow. He's like, focus on him, and then just lay out what you have on your heart to God. Share it with him and just put it out there so that he can respond to it. And in fact, the very next verses is kind of interesting. You might not know that if you were raised in just a traditional uh, setting, Catholic setting, because we have so many Catholics, of course, in the Illinois Valley, um, that the very next part of this, he actually brings even more clarity to the subject in Luke 11, 5 through 10. He's just teaching them more about prayer. He used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight wanting to borrow three loaves of bread, and you say to him, a friend of mine's just arrived for a visit, and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me, the door's locked for the night and my family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. And so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receive. Everyone who seeks, finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be open. He didn't tell this story to say God is like an ignorant neighbor that doesn't want to give you food. Like Wrong application. He said, even your ignorant neighbor who doesn't want to give you food would give you some if you were persistent at it. And he says, so even more so, your great loving father, that he said, be persistent. He says, everyone who asks will get an answer. Some people are like, that's not true. I've prayed for something and it didn't come true. I was like, he said answer. He didn't say what you asked for. 
Very often you'll pray for things that God will give you an answer you don't want. You know that, right? And then a whole bunch of you, you know what's funny? Is you'll get like five years down the line and you're like, oh, thank God. Yes, thank you for that no, God. Thank you. When I prayed like, God, please, and you were like, no, and I was like, why? And then like five years later, you're like, that's why. Yeah, thank you. God always gives an answer. So many of us, let me tell you, you know why you need to be persistent in prayer? I'll be really honest with you, okay? Can I be really honest with you, just who I am? Because some of you, you think like that I'm like some sort of super Christian. I'm not. Oh man, I struggle. The reason why you have to be persistent in prayer is because you share things with God and sometimes after you share them with him, you pray them three or four times and then all of a sudden God shows you, he's like, is that really what you want to be saying to me right now? And you're like, no, no. I've had seasons in my life that I've prayed to God and I, I've, I've prayed to God for stuff like more stuff. Like, God, give me more money. Give me more stuff. God, just do this. And then sometimes what God will do is he'll take me through a season and he'll say, is that really what you want for me? And then I'll realize, no, what I want is I want more joy. What I want is more peace. I don't want a million dollars and to miss out on my kids' lives because I'm too busy building something to be able to be part of their lives. You see, the persistence in it, it's not just the idea that we're just going to ask and ask and ask and he's going to have to give it to us. It's like having a conversation with a loving father over and over and over again where he can keep speaking into it. If you just talk to God once, right, here's my thought, and you just walk away, that's all the opportunity you have to be able to hear his heart on the subject. But when you're persistent in talking to him, you have this opportunity to hear from him as well consistently. Prayer doesn't need to be some sort of crazy thing. Here's what I would say prayer should be. According to Jesus, simple, consistent. Simple, consistent. And listen, fasting is this great way that we can test out less distractions. It's a great way that we can see what would happen if we cut something out of our life and we took that instead and focused it on prayer because prayer is where you can truly find your focus. And that's what I want for you in 2024. Listen, here's what I would love to offer to some of you. For some of you, I would love to invite you to do a fast for the first time ever or the first time in a really long time, okay? Now, you could pick a meal, a day, whatever you'd like. Some of you guys, you fasted more. The longest I've ever fasted was seven days and it beat me up, okay? So don't start there. Be like, I think I'm just gonna, not going to eat for the whole week. It probably won't turn out well, Okay? Also, like, if you're like, ah, I have all these health problems and I have all this, and they told me if I don't eat, I'll die. But Cameron said, no. Mm -mm. I take no responsibility for your physical health, friend. But for some of you, you might just be like, listen, because of our American culture, for real, okay, for real, a lot of you, you have never gone one day without eating. How weird is that? Because our culture is so saturated by food. It's so prevalent in our culture to say, I'm going to take a day and I am going to declare a fast and say, whatever hunger is inside of me, I'm going to devote to the Lord. It might be just awakening to you to be able to experience that. For some more of you, listen, maybe you don't need a classic fast. I would encourage all of you to think, maybe even just start with a meal. Start with a day and try it out. But also, this is the case you might also want to try a fast of a different persuasion. Because while fasting eliminates something that, that takes some of your time and some of your energy, for a lot of us, there are other things that are eating up substantially more energy than our eating. In fact, you can do this. In the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 5, he actually talks about how people can, again, lay aside something that's a blessing in order to focus on prayer. In this one, it was interesting because he's talking about how husbands and wives should be satisfying each other as far as their sexual desires. But he even says this, the husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs. The wife should fulfill her husband's sexual needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband. The husband gives authority over his body to his wife. And he says this, but don't deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from this intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourself more completely to prayer. 
Afterwards, you should come back together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Again, he says, a married couple where this is a blessing, your love life is a blessing inside of him. He said, you can find yourselves in times where you're so wanting something from the Lord. He says that even just the natural blessings in your life, you can say, as much as I want these desires, we can just agree to set them aside and say, I just want to focus my mind and my body in unity with my greatest desire is to hear from the Lord. And just like the stomach might be that, he said that we might be in this case, right? It would literally be the libido where it's like, more than I want anything of intimacy, I just want intimacy with you, God. Some of you need to fast, but it doesn't need to be food. I'll be honest with you, in our current culture, it's really, really simple. It's these. There are a whole bunch of you that this eats up so much of your time. In fact, real quick for you, some of you this last week, I told you about that Bible reading plan and you didn't even kind of get into that Bible reading plan because you had no time. I had no time. I had no time. I bet you any money if you check your screen time, you spent more than 15 minutes a day on these. That's all it would take to hear from God. But it eats up so much much. And maybe it's just that. You're like, I want to fast. I want to cut something out, right? Like going on Facebook in and of itself, not sinful. Going on Twitter in and of itself, not sinful. But I want to cut something away so that I can make time for something that I want even more. And it'll work just like our food. You'll go to grab your phone to look at it and you're like, oh wait. A really easy way. I did this at the beginning of this year. I just deleted all my social apps off my phone. Dude, for like two weeks, I would just pull out my phone to be like, let's check. Oh yeah, it's not there. Because I want to focus on prayer. And I would turn to the Lord and pray instead of scrolling mindlessly through something. Talk to the Lord about what's on my heart. Go home, sit down with my kids, sit on the couch. They're watching some kids show where I'm like, I do not find this interesting at all, right? I'll just scroll on. Oh wait, yeah, that's gone. I took that off my phone. I guess I can sit here and while they watch this show, I can talk to the Lord about what's on my heart and what I want to see happen in this year and where I want to go. So you can try a fast like this. Now, there's only one rule of fasting. Do you want to know the one rule of fasting? We're wrapping up. You guys, are you still with me? Okay, good. All right. Didn't think I lost you. I started talking about not eating food and you guys were like, I'm out, bro. Matthew 6, 16 through 18 says this, when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth. That's the only reward you will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair, wash your face, and then no one will notice that you're fasting except your father who knows what you do in private. And your father who sees everything will reward you. Only rule about fasting, you don't tell people you're fasting. Don't go home today and be like, oh, your, your, your family makes this beautiful meal, right? And you're like, I'd love to, but you know what? I just decided I'm going to fast, right? God's like, well, that's all you got. It was just that one moment of people being like, wow, they're holy. He's like, you're not going to hear anything from me because if it's about them, it's about them. It's not about me. Same thing with social media. You guys are going to be like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get off of Facebook right now. Don't go home and do the obligatory. Hey, friends, going to get off here for a little bit. Check back in a month. People can deal without your Facebook or Instagram post for a month. If you don't post anything and just disappear, if anyone actually loves you, they'll just send you a message. You don't need to tell them outright. Uh, guys, I just decided I need to fast from this. Don't do that. People will just be like, they just laugh at you. And again, that's all you get. If it's about you and God, make it about you and God. I'm just going to eliminate this. I'm going to cut out this so I can focus on God for this moment. And then listen to me. Here's the next part, okay? You got to stick with it. Because the second you decide to fast, temptation will come. I guarantee you, this next week, if you plan a day, you go, Wednesday, I'm going to fast. Wednesday, someone's going to offer you free lunch. <laughs> Every time. Wednesday, they're going to walk in with free donuts. And you're like, mm. it always happens. You decide, I'm going to fast from Facebook. Tomorrow, it's going to be like, oh my gosh, did you see what Cheryl posted on Facebook? And you're going to be like, oh, what is it? It's always going to happen. And you have to decide, wait a second. No, 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 no more than I want to see what crazy Cheryl posted on Facebook. <laughs> I 
I want to hear from you. More than I want those donuts. Oh, God, I want to hear your voice in my life. I am declaring a fast at Axe Church. I'm declaring a fast. This next year, I want to have you lean into it. But here's what I would just love to invite you to do. I would love to challenge you to think today, tomorrow, if there's something you could try out this next week. Maybe it's a day without food. Maybe it's to eliminate something off the phone, off the social media. Maybe it's to eliminate something else. But I just want to invite you to pray and say, is there something that I could fast in this next week? Just to do that test. Fasting is this great test of less distractions to see if when you had that and you could focus more time on prayer, you would get more of that focus. Would you pray with me for just for a second? God, I pray that you would help us apply this to our lives. Right now, I pray you'd send your Holy Spirit. You're so good, God, that when we have hundreds of people sitting together, you can simultaneously speak individual words to all of us at the exact same time. That right now, you can speak to each and every one of us what our thing is. And I pray that you would do that right now, that you would draw us towards the idea of this. Some people are scared, just like, this seems uncomfortable. And I pray that you would just draw them into that discomfort. I also pray right now, God, that if there's anybody here in our, in our service or online that they don't know you, and they wonder, how could I trust God like this? I pray that they, they would just take a step of faith in this moment, not knowing everything about their faith, but they just, they sense that you are good, that you are kind, that you are loving, that you are who you said you are. And maybe right now they would just pray this prayer in their hearts. They would say, Jesus, I'm sorry, man, I am a sinner Just like that guy in that story, I'm not coming here beating my chest, being like, I fast twice a week and I I give this. I'm the other guy. I need you. I don't know what to do. And I pray that you would do the very same you promised in that, that you would bring justification to their heart. You would forgive them of their sins as they come close to you. You would rescue them from their sin and their shame and you would make them your son or daughter. God, make us more like you through this practice. In Jesus' name we pray.